Well, hello there, and welcome to Food Lab Talk. I'm your host, Michael Bakker. When we think about food and nutrition, most of us will immediately think about natural, organic, or healthy products, delicious plant forward dishes, maybe even sustainable food systems. But every day, one in eight Americans face food insecurity. Today's guest is Clancy Cash Harrison, and she made it her mission to shine a light on those injustices. Clancy is an internationally renowned speaker, food equity advocate, founder of the Food Dignity Movement, TV and media contributor, and a registered dietitian. For nearly 30 years, Clancy has stood as a beacon of hope and relentless advocacy in the fight against hunger, food inequity, and institutional food racism. With deep expertise in addressing biases and systemic barriers to food access, Glancy helps leaders redefine their role of food in society, advocating for food as a basic human right. She is the catalyst for companies across North America who want to join the deeper conversation around food and build a more equitable and sustainable future. In her work and her weekly Food Dignity podcast, Clancy challenges conversation and conventional thinking about food insecurity and food choice. And that's what I'm hoping for in our conversation today, to challenge some conventional thinking around food and food systems. Clancy, welcome to the show. I'm so inspired by the work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. It is beyond an honor. So how did you start working in the charitable food industry? And what was it that inspired you to create the Food Dignity Movement? Well, that's kind of a long question. I'm going to try to make it really short as much as I can. I'm a registered dietitian. And after I had children, I wanted to do something different. And I started volunteering at our church food pantry over a decade. And when I was there, I did not realize I had a lot of misconceptions around what food insecurity, what hunger was, until I put myself into that nonprofit as a volunteer and I was the president. And during that time, as I uncovered my hidden bias as a healthcare provider, I knew I needed to speak out on that topic. And it turned into a TEDx talk, but it also took me to Congress where I was able to be a leader in the Community Voice Project. I was able to interview people about their stories and experiences with hunger, maybe even their success stories on how they survived and then thrived later. Out of five interviews, two of my stories went to Congress, including my own about my misconceptions. And so I never really said I wanted to fight hunger. I just, it fell into my lap. And now I started a nonprofit. After being there for many years, I realized that we were serving the same people every day. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also knew as a dietitian, we weren't getting people who needed help that would probably never set foot in a food pantry because of shame and stigma. And so we started the nonprofit organization, the Food Dignity Movement, where now we are creating really a best practice that could be expanded across our nation. We're connecting small nonprofits to our local farmers, where we are actually serving food that was planted, grown, harvested for hunger in mind. Hunger was not an afterthought. The lettuce was harvested that morning. The corn was harvested that morning. And what we're seeing within this nonprofit, so imagine us working with 30 different nonprofits, smaller nonprofits. We're working with people who are running from domestic violence. We're working with people in substance abuse recovery, New Roots, uh, Grief Camp, which is at our local hillside farms where children are receiving services from trauma that they've experienced. Victims Resource Center told me that because we're providing food on site at a time of service, they have an increase in participation in their programming, in their counseling. But more importantly, food is not a reason that a woman will go back to a domestic violence situation because she has peace of mind that she's feeding her children. So what we're doing is we're looking at how does food actually improve our economic development, our workforce development? How do we improve the outcomes of other nonprofits just by making sure that people have nourishing food at a steady supply of that when they come in for their services? Heard. One of my follow-up questions for you is, you've been talking about your collaboration 
and partnership with all kinds of other organizations. Collaboration is really, really hard. So tell me a little bit more about your experiences about working with others. And I guess would be that's my personal perception is that the question that you're asking yourself, the complexity tax of working with others versus the impact you can make by working with others. Mm. We started something, uh, we do a, a local think tank of the smaller nonprofits and we come together once a year. And I have to say, actually last week I was meeting with a new partner and I brought a grant to him. And he said, why are you giving me a grant that you're also applying for? Usually we fight over this and we don't share this information. And I said to him, we have to resource share. We have to information share. We have to support each other because unless we all come together and if we continue to work in our silos and are forced to work against each other in the nonprofit industry, we are never going to un uncover food insecurity. We're never going to end food insecurity. And I think the biggest thing, I have been blessed, even when I get off the phone with this, I have a call with New Roots. It's a drug and alcohol recovery. They have been super supportive. We actually use their parking lot for produce distribution. I love the fact that we can say that we're working with the nonprofits and now they're seeing people stay in recovery longer because we're providing food. And I also, just to push a little further here, we're challenging each other to stop just counting numbers. We're looking at the person as a whole. The charitable food system loves to count pounds of food served. It loves to count numbers of meals served or number of people served. And I always say access to food does not mean someone participated. And if someone participates, they actually pick up the food and take it home. It doesn't mean that they consumed it. We need to understand in our grant writing, and I hope that funders become more strict, and I hope corporations who are donating money to these causes are saying, how are you actually changing the lives of the people that you're serving? And once we do that, again, it's like this magic happens. And we can start looking at the person as a whole and not as a number. So much to unpack over here. Maybe just to frame it up for our audience, the term hidden hunger. Could you elaborate on that a little bit so we actually have a good understanding of some of what it is we're talking about? Sure. So as a speaker, I told you that this turned into a speaking platform. Now I'm a professional speaker and I go around and I will speak to 5,000 people at a time. And one of the things that keeps coming up is that most leaders, most healthcare professionals who are in my audience don't understand the true definition of hunger or the full scope. Many times we think of hunger as maybe it's a third world problem, a third world challenge. Maybe it's an inner city challenge. Maybe it's generational poverty. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist there, but we need to expand on where else it exists. And I want to challenge anyone listening to this, that hunger actually lives in your organization. Your employees could be food insecure because they have other bills, they might have uh, medical bills, they tuition, a life change, a divorce, a death in the family, all these things could cause food stress. And we need to really start looking at food insecurity and nutrition insecurity from that lens that it could be anyone at any time. And we are all very close to being in a situation at some point in our life experiencing a hardship that creates that food stress around food access. Thank you for clarifying all of that. You know, this podcast is really about change leaders. And I'm just curious about two elements you talked about so far, your own misperceptions, misconceptions, and then you go from that to being a TEDx speaker. So the first one is, talk to me a little bit more about how you dealt with your misperceptions, misconceptions, and how you ultimately came to term with those. And then two, how did you move from that to not even just acknowledging it yourself, but sharing it with the broader world. Yeah, so I think the most important thing to understand is when I went into that food pantry, I thought I was going to help people. It was charity. And when I got into this organization, which was our church, I realized 
I made a lot of mistakes as a healthcare provider. So for example, if I'm working with someone who has diabetes and as a provider, I try to have them eat something completely different, maybe it's broccoli, to manage their diabetes. I never really asked people if they had access to that broccoli or that food we wanted them to eat. I never really asked what they wanted to eat. I jumped right into that evidence base, which there's always a place for evidence-based guidelines, right? But so many times healthcare provider, and I think we need to be careful now with food as medicine coming down the pipeline with a lot of funding, that too many times we're always adapting the individual to the evidence-based guidelines. And if we think about evidence-based guidelines, they could be very rigid they could have cost a lot more resources. So it costs money to eat healthier food, nourishing food. It's going to cost money to join a gym and work out. It's going to cost time. It might create a different transportation challenge. And all of these things, if we have people set up to these standards and we're not asking them about their barriers to food access, what are the barriers from the lens that they're experiencing them and truly trying to find out what works and what doesn't work for them, how can we create solutions that work? And I knew that first I had to have be humble enough to say I was wrong. One of the questions I started asking myself is, where am I wrong so I can be right? And now we have our volunteers asking the same question. What are we here to learn today from the people that we're working with? And when you start addressing your work from that lens and you start asking those deep self-reflective questions and you're willing to say that you're wrong and you don't understand and you're not the expert, you might be the expert in nutrition or whatever you studied, but you're not an expert in someone's life and what works for them. And, you know, Michael, I could say to you, you probably have some problem in your life. We all have a problem. You probably know what barriers you have that's creating that problem. And you probably have a good idea on the solution to fix that problem. You might need help figuring that out, but you know what's going to work for you. And so when I realized I actually perpetuated hunger and poverty as a healthcare provider unintentionally, I, I didn't go out saying that that's what I want to do for, I mean, I was volunteering at a food pantry, right? I wanted to help the situation. But when I learned that my own hidden bias, my own misconceptions and judgments actually stood in the way of creating programs that have solutions that work. I knew that I had to stop assuming what a problem is and including the voice of the person we're working with to help us create those solutions. And when we started making that change at the food pantry, but also who we consult with, now we, we do a lot of consulting with organizations and, and leaders on this very topic. And the other nonprofits that we're working with, suddenly we're seeing an increase in programs. Our outcomes are better. We have a greater participation rate. People are more engaged. We have a better morale. We are, we're building trust. We have communication. Our clients, feel seen, valued, understood. So the environment changes and that sets us all up for success. So I hope I answer that question, but knowing that's a big aha. And I had to share that aha and I hired a speaking coach. And then the next thing you know, I'm applying for a TEDx. And now this is what I'm speaking. And I'm actually in the process of writing a book on this very topic. Love books, love you writing books, do it. What I heard you say, which is, I think, really, really striking to me from your own question, where am I wrong so I can be right? That is a fascinating insight, I think, for change makers, because I would agree with you that so many of us want to do well and we show up and we're participating and obviously credit to all of us who are showing up. But maybe, as you just mentioned, based on our biases, we're not helping and we're just actually prolonging the same challenge. So I am happy that you came to the realization and that you're sharing your insights with the broader world. Before we dive deeper into actually enabling individual choices, I think it's such an interesting question in the context of what you're doing. So how might we enable individuals to make informed, personally relevant food choices? I want to talk about the bigger picture first for a moment. What do you see as the critical elements that make for a truly equitable food system? Easy peasy question. Oh, that's, a, yeah, that's a really easy question. That's actually a really hard question. Well, for me, first of all, we know that hunger is an extremely challenging, complex nutrition challenge. 
And unfortunately, we have put that challenge on the shoulders of the major food banking systems in the United States. And while there's a great place for food banks and they're doing great work, we also need to take hunger out of the charity box. Every sector at the table, we need to create solutions that work. And in order to do that, we have to understand that hunger is a threat to our national security. How can we have men and women fighting for our country who are malnourished or unhealthy? It is a threat to our future workforce. At the end of the day, if we have a population who is unhealthy, they're going to have higher utilization rates. We know food insecurity puts people at risk for 10 chronic diseases. And then think about the children. If they are going through school and they're hungry, how are they concentrating? How does that help them get past high school? Do they go to a trade school? Are they going off into the military food insecure and malnourished? Are they able to get into a a university and study? I think that the other thing that we have to consider all sectors is that food insecurity, hunger is a public health crisis. At the end of the day, most Americans don't consume enough fruits and vegetables. That is food insecurity within itself. And there's a lot of barriers. It's not always economic. It's not always about affordability, but it's about accessibility and other barriers that exist within our society. And then going back to that full definition, we talked about that. We really need to understand that full definition of hunger. And then finally, I think from a global standpoint and at the United States level, when we're working in a charitable food system, what I think the missing link is, is that we need to make sure not only are we fighting for food equity, but we are creating food sustainability. So that money that's invested, I'm talking 100% of the money that's invested, we are making sure that we are supporting our local small farmers, not just the big ones. Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that our farmers are not shutting down. If our small farmers keep shutting down time and time again, which is alarming rates across the United States, we are all going to be food insecure at one point. And so how can we start looking at food insecurity as a challenge for workforce development, economic development, nutrition security, economic nutrition security, and sustainability of our local farmers? So I know that was a lot, but I know that we need to change the way we address food insecurity and we need every person at the table, all sectors at the table. Yeah. What I heard, take hunger out of the charity box. That is such a profound statement. So a personal follow-up question for you as a change leader. You're never done. So what continues to energize you because the problem is so incredibly large? My gut action to this answer is... The more people I piss off, I know I'm doing something right, especially if they're not willing to listen to the solutions or they try to prevent your nonprofit from getting funding. That actually energizes me because then I know I'm onto something. The other thing that energizes me is when I'm on stage or I'm working with someone, another leader, and it, you just see it click. And my hope is that people see a piece of them in my story where I made judgments. And when that happens and when that clicks and they follow me and they say, guess what, Clancy, I'm a recovering, I call myself a recovering food elitist. I think it's funny. And I will have people follow me out in the parking lot. I'm a recovering food elitist too. And now I realize I need to ask better questions. I need to do something different. That energizes me. I would say the third thing is that energizes me is when I get notes or I'm working with someone who needs help and they clearly let me know that they feel seen and valued. They know that their opinions, their needs, their desires matter. And Michael, I can tell you that it took me two years to fight my board to get a walk-in cooler outside. They would call it an accessory and I called it an asset. And I proved to them that once we find took Two years to spend $8,000 on a little walk-in cooler outside. And so I spent the next like four or five years keeping track of all the free produce that went through that cooler that was actually consumed. And, And a long time ago, we started buying from our local farmers. It wasn't like why I was at that food pantry, because I wanted to make sure that it was food that I would want to eat. Now, when we started setting up our produce stands within the food pantry, our clients cried. They cried. Many of them said, I can finally follow my doctor's advice. 
because now I have access to this food. Most of the people at that food pantry that we were serving were seniors in a high rise. They didn't have a car that they could go to any grocery store. So we were their primary. It wasn't really an emergency food supply. It was more of a staple for them. And then we had people who were sharing their cancer stories, their heart disease stories, and they're in tears because they have fresh produce. So I do think it's important that we provide that fresh produce at all levels. And you're going to see a lot of money is coming down in food as medicine. By the way, dietitians have been doing this for years. It's not a new concept at all. But it's really important that, again, if we're going to provide the produce, that we're supporting those small farmers in its economic development and workforce development. At the end of the day, I always say my boss is the homeless veteran. My boss is the mom running from domestic violence, the single mom trying to feed her kids, the elderly person who has slipped through the cracks but is too proud to ask for help, the new Americans that are trying to navigate a complex system. They're my boss. And so as long as there's injustice that they're facing around food, I'm always going to speak up and I'm always going to challenge until we start making the changes needed to reverse those injustice. And I do believe it starts with uncovering our hidden bias. Yeah. Then bringing it back to the theme of this season, Clancy, enabling individuals to make informed personally relevant food choices. In the context of the work that you do, where do you see opportunities with regards to that broader aspiration that we have? So I'm just really going to go back to that question is, where am I wrong so I could be right? Having that work on the ground for nearly 30 years in public health, that direct service experience has led me to believe that, again, people are the experts in their life. And so it starts with asking one question. If you're a nonprofit leader, even if you run a food pantry, what do you want to eat that helps with culturally appropriate food? If you're asking the question with the true intent of wanting to know the right answer, the real answer, the answer that they want to share with you without judgment. And if you have that honesty and that open dialogue, you're going to be able to source food that's going to meet any allergies, any medical needs, any culturally appropriate religious foods that that person needs. And then you do your best in trying to source that food. But how often do we ask that question or do we just, you get what you get and you don't get upset type mentality in the charitable food system or the nonprofit industry? And, and, and I want to, uncovering your own judgments, if you don't mind, I would love to share a story, you know. It's a quick story, but it's a story about soda. So many times we can work in the healthcare industry asking people not to drink soda. I love soda, so I'm just going to put that out there. I'm not bashing soda, but you know, there's appropriate amounts that we can consume and we can have it for fun. But anyways, if we're working with an individual and it's a single mom, here's the example, single mom, she was giving her children soda to drink. And as a dietitian, I could say, you know, maybe water is a better choice, maybe milk, maybe juice. Why soda all the time? And I could keep going back and forth, back and forth. But because I had that relationship with her and I had the trust of her, I was able to find out the why. And she said, the soda doesn't have to be refrigerated. I can get it anywhere. And the carbonation and the sugar, when it's combined, it gives my children a feeling of fullness so they can go to bed with a full belly, the feeling of a full belly, not hunger pains. And so they can go to sleep. So if you think about uncovering those whys, taking the time to understand why people are making certain choices versus judgment. That's the biggest gift you can give yourself as an educator or someone who wants to create change, but it's also the biggest gift you could give someone because now we can focus on what the real needs is with that mom. And I share this story all the time when I'm on stage. And it, what's I think really interesting is I always have someone in the audience that comes up to me and said, I did that. I once had a SNAP educator who does nutrition education. And she said, I actually had to do that this morning, except I put the soda in my kid's cereal because I knew that they would go to school feeling full. And she was crying and she knew it wasn't the best choice, but that was her level of sustainability as a single mother. And sometimes when we think of sustainability, we're thinking of these big, huge things that we need to create or change. 
But how can we create that change unless we understand the sustainability level of a person who is experiencing food insecurity, food stress, chronic hunger every day? Because unless we have their voice, we're not going to be able to create those bigger changes that we need. That is hard to hear. Wow. You mentioned as well, you've been in this space for now over 30 years. If you knew them, what you know now, and if you meet when speaking, you know, people who are new to this arena, what advice would you share with them about what you have learned? Is it that you can ultimately start with more insights up front, or is it just a natural leading uh, leadership journey where you just have to experience it yourself and as you get older, you become wiser and more seasoned? What are your thoughts on that? What would you share with your younger version? My younger version, I'd probably be like, Clancy, you, <laughs> when I, I remember when I became a dietitian, I thought I was going to save the world. I thought I was going to end hunger. I thought I was going to end diabetes. And like, everyone's going to listen to me because I have this master's and I have a bachelor's in nutrition. And I was so excited. And so I wanted to create that change. And I don't know if I would tell her anything different because I wouldn't want to squash that. I do know that when I work with my students, I will say to them, you'll never learn this in nutrition school. And we will call up one of our clients. And the one day it was Victims Resource Center. And I said, okay, Suzanne, where are we wrong? So we can be right. What are we doing wrong? And she's like, well, Clancy, she's like, I love the cabbage. I love it. But when I'm going on a sting operation, I can't give a mom going to a hotel room cabbage. She needs something that she can eat immediately in all three of those cases. In the hotel room, they need something that's going to be in a smaller refrigerator or a smaller microwave. And I remember looking at my students and I said, that's where you're going to grow and that's where you're going to learn. You have to be willing to say you don't have the answers. And if you can do that and you can be strong enough, within yourself and humble enough to do that, that's where you're going to succeed. And that's where you're going to find the solutions that are going to work. So I think that's exactly how I work with my students now. That's exactly what I would probably do with myself. Gosh, 30 years ago. That's so sad. No, you should celebrate what you've done over the last 30 years and think about what is yet to come. I agree. And one thing that I love to tell people is that Food pantries need volunteers, but I'm going to challenge anyone listening that hunger lives in your church. It lives at your school that your kids go to. It lives in your employees if you're an employer. So how do you start addressing food insecurity at the level of where you are at? And that I, I'm willing to help anyone identify that. Because I always say you need to find that crack and then be the glue. You don't always have to go outside. We need to start looking internally and start making things better for people. And so, yeah, I, I, even though I never said I was going to do this work, when I started seeing problems, I started asking questions. And that's the most important thing you can do. So... I so much enjoyed the conversation with you today. You've given me some really interesting lines. Taking hunger out of the charity box, a recovering food elitist. Where am I wrong so I can be right? That is, I think, the one that's going to stick with me. Made it on my post-it note. So with that, I would say thank you so much for your time today and keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me on this podcast. I'm beyond honored. So thank you. Reflecting on today's interview, here are my top three takeaways for change makers. Affecting systems change requires us to consider and not become paralyzed by the complex interdependencies. In Clancy's case, solving hunger is not simply about providing food to those in need. It is about using funding dollars to support local farmers and local economies. It is about the power of food providing choice in other aspects of a person's life. It is about measuring the right thing to ensure the output, 
more food available, has the desired impact, fewer people hungry. It can be easy to see these interdependencies and become overwhelmed. But what I admire about Clancy is that she acknowledges the complexities and she's effective at driving change. In the dynamic landscape of change making, collaboration is a key ingredient for success. Breaking down silos and facilitating information sharing becomes imperative to accelerating progress and innovation. As Clancy noted, effective communication, including understanding the language of your partners and customers, plays a pivotal role in fostering openness and cooperation. By dismantling these barriers, teams share insights, resources, and expertise freely, leading to truly shared outcomes and lasting impact. And lastly, for sure my favorite, ask yourself, where am I wrong so I can be right? As change makers, we must be willing to say that we don't have all the answers. Approach problems as Clancy did, humbly, and uncover our hidden biases. That's how we become better problem solvers and create solutions that truly work. For more information about the Food Dignity Challenge, the documentary, and how you can get involved, be sure to check out the show notes. And thank you for joining us for this episode. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the podcast at foodlaptop.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. And be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube at Food Lab Talk. As we close, I invite you to pursue your own bold vision and take whatever action you can take toward a better food system. Imagine, believe, and most importantly, act. See you next time.